Does anybody remember the RTX 4812 gig? Because this is definitely not the same product. There has not been a rebrand, there has not been new packaging and probably some very heated arguments going on behind closed doors. But here's the thing, right? All jokes aside, this is actually a very desirable graphics card because even the RTX 4080 and arguably the RX 7900 XTX were still really overkill for arguably what most people are going to need. So something like this that's going to sit somewhere a little bit lower in the very high end but not the ultra high end segment could be perfect for high-end 1440p gaming, ultra-wide 1440p, anything like that, this should be a very interesting GPU. So in this video, we're going to be building ourselves a kick-ass gaming PC with this brand new GPU. We're going to be showing you how to put it all together, all of the parts, and of course, we'll be showing you those all-important gameplay benchmark numbers so you know exactly how this thing performs and ultimately whether it is going to be worth buying. So join me on what should be a pretty meticulous ride. I don't even know what that word means, but it's going to add to the excitement. On to a short word from this video's sponsor. AlphaSync is the place to get the pre-built system of your dreams. Without any knowledge on how to build a PC, AlphaSync gets you top branded components at all budgets, lovingly put together right here in the UK. Either choose a master crafted AlphaSync specification or design yours from scratch. The choice is entirely up to you. Get your game on today with that link down below. So yes, I know there have been graphics card launches left, right and centre and everyone's telling you all sorts of different things. But I'd like to think I've been pretty consistent in telling you that these things are very good, but the value isn't really there. And for me, having something like this has actually always been quite a bit more interesting to me. I mean, this is still arguably too high end for most people, but we are at least getting down to a more affordable price. So let's take this out of the box. And then there you go, our brand new graphics card. And this is actually a fair bit smaller than the top end stuff, which is good, because I was a little bit worried that this was just gonna be sort of rehashed coolers from the top end. And granted, this still could be, but this is actually, well, a lot more respectable when it comes to size, which is good, because you're not gonna need the extra cooling. This is probably gonna use a max of around about 280 watts or so. And obviously you don't wanna be paying for a cooler that you're not going to use. That has been one of my big sort of complaints of this generation so far. So it's nice to see a little bit more mainstream when it comes to design. I genuinely almost dropped that. That would have been bad. Oh no, we do have an accessory box though. And I think I know what's inside this. Oh no. Oh no. Although actually there are only two power connections on this. Ah. Try not to choke on the plastic. <laughs> and there you go. And you now have something that looks a little bit more normal and like the last gen. We have two eight pins into one 12 pin or 16 if you're including the sense pins. So this will attach into the GPU like so. And there you have your horrible, weird alien adapter. But I like to think actually that this GPU doesn't look too bad. It's a nice design. This is the one from Palette. This is the Gaming Pro. I think they will do their RGB over the top game rock version as well, but this is probably the one most people want to go for. I do have a lot more to say about the RTX 4070 Ti, but we will be discussing this as we actually put it in our rig a little bit later, including yes, the fact that this only has 12 gigabytes of memory, whether this is going to affect you, and ultimately the whole name change thing, whether that's worth getting upset about, or whether we should just sort of leave it and move on. And I must confess that we are doing things slightly different this time around, because this motherboard is actually one back in the range. This is a micro ATX motherboard, B660, and this means it is going to support the current 13th generation of Intel CPUs and the previous 12th gen. The only caveat is that you will need to do a BIOS update in order to get one of these older ones to work. And the problem with this motherboard is that you actually need an old CPU to do it. You don't have any form of USB BIOS flashing, which is really annoying. I've actually updated this one. However, it doesn't matter for this video because we're going to save ourselves some money and actually use the previous generation i5. And this might be a little bit controversial, but at the moment you can save around about 70 pounds by going for this versus the current 13th gen. That is a very, very good CPU. But when we run the benchmarks a little bit later, if we find that we're not bottlenecking at all, then obviously this is money well saved. But if you do want to go for like a 13th gen i5 or i7, please make sure you're buying a motherboard that can actually be USB flashed. Otherwise you're going to run into some potential issues. But let's grab our motherboard and place it on top of our box. We then grab our i5 processor out of the box. And this was an absolute banger of a CPU. I wouldn't actually buy the overclocked version. I'd probably go for the non K if it's a little bit cheaper just because you can't overclock on B series anyway, but it does support faster overclocked RAM, which is nice. But you just drop this in, this bit pops off. This has six performance cores and then four efficiency for a total of 10. 
So even though it's not the absolute newest chip, it's still going to be perfect for a gaming PC. And you can always upgrade this at a later date, like to a 13th Gen i7 or i9. Once they get a little bit cheaper and become used in a couple of years time, that's going to be a really easy upgrade for you. You don't always have to buy the latest, especially when you're building like a more value orientated rig. And on that note, we're using some DDR4 memory, not DDR5. And you can find my video all about this in the top right corner of your screen. It's very recent, we go through DDR5 speeds and DDR4, and you'll notice that there aren't really any big differences between DDR4 and DDR5, even with an RTX 4090. So with this 4070 Ti, I would expect you to pretty much see no difference on the DDR5 version of this exact same motherboard. But installing the memory is very straightforward. Just line it up with the slots, give it a good push, and then that is your RAM or memory installed. Continuing our money-saving trend, here we have our SSD. This is a 980 from Samsung. It's actually Gen 3, not even Gen 4. Forget about Gen 5. But it doesn't really matter again when it comes to outright speeds because it's fast enough that you're not going to notice any real difference in load speeds, but it's not like Gen 4 and it's not Gen 4 price. I would actually advise going for a one terabyte or above. Don't get this 500 gig unless you're on a really tight budget. But obviously, if you're buying a RTX 4070 Ti, you can probably afford more than 500 gig. Just grab a small screwdriver and undo this top slot. If you are using a Gen 4 drive though, I would advise putting it in this top slot so you're not missing out on its full rated speed. Then you just grab the drive, line it up, and push it down, making sure that back cover of this has been removed, and then just place it back on top and screw it down. And at this point, you might be thinking that you're done and ready to get it inside your chassis. But actually, there's one more step to do, and that is to install your cooler backplate if you're using an all-in-one. Or today, we're actually using an air cooler because this isn't going to use too much power. I mean, it will use a surprising amount, especially if you turn all the limits off but you don't really need anything crazy. So we're gonna go for something a little bit more entry level. This is the i35 Arctic Freezer. I bought this one myself actually and I found that it does work very well. If you want to go for something a little bit bigger, that is absolutely fine. We'll be testing thermals a little bit later. We might find that this is slightly underpowered, but I don't think it will be. I could be proved wrong, but obviously that's the whole point of these videos. Pick up your motherboard and turn it over. Grab this little back plate and feed it through like that. Then you can grab these little rubber spacers and just gently place them over the screw holes. Then you get these little mounting plates and just lay them on top of those screws that are poking out. Then you have these tiny little black caps tighten with a screwdriver. But otherwise, all we need to do is grab some thermal paste, add some in the middle of our chip, little pea-sized amount. Then you can pick up the cooler, line it up with those screw holes. Realize that you need to actually take the fan off before we can do this. Then we can place it back down and screw this into place. Fix it down, making sure to use equal force on the left and the right. Then you can pick up your little hat, slide this back on the cooler, and it should just snap straight back into place. The only thing you need to do is actually plug in this fan and RGB. The fan connects at the top here, where it says CPU fan. And then the RGB is just next to the cooler here connects just like that. Right, mild incompetence out of the way. We can now press on and talk to you about this case. And this is right up my alley. I think there will be people out there that won't like the fact that you can't see inside it. If this is a deal breaker for you, I don't know, let Asus know in the comments below that they should sell a glass panel for this. Maybe they do, I'm not sure. This is very much an airflow orientated micro ATX chassis. That's pretty much all about no compromises. So you can fit a 360 radiator at the top. You can fit extra lung graphics cards. I'm not sure if you can do both at the same time if you're using a very big power supply because unusually the PSU actually goes up here at the front. But otherwise, this is almost like a bigger version of the NR200P from Cooler Master. I think this exact case name is the AP201. I definitely didn't read that from the box that was over there. But it's built very well. This isn't the absolute cheapest micro ATX case. I think it comes in around about 90 to 100 pounds. But I like what you get for the money. They focused on the things that matter. I mean, if we open this up around the back as well. Cable management actually is going to be okay. There's plenty of channeling here, but maybe not that much for the rest of the case because it's actually very thin all around here. So if you want to use thick cables, maybe like the CPU, you might actually struggle to fit it in, but we'll be giving it a good go. But just grab your case and of course lay it down flat. Pick up your entire motherboard unit, then gently slide it in so that the IO plate lines up with the big hole at the back. It's a little bit fiddly sometimes. But once it's in, you'll know about it. 
then you've got some screw holes to actually plug in here. If you're going to use a micro ATX motherboard in an ATX case, you will actually need to move the standoffs that come pre-applied, but because this is a micro ATX case, everything is already in the right place for us. So it's very, very simple and straightforward. Now that that's in, we can start getting some other components in. And I think I want the power supply next because otherwise it's gonna get a little bit cramped too quickly. It looks as if there is like this quick release bar but I think you have to undo a couple of screws to access it first. Yep, then that just slides out, he says. Oh, oh, I've worked it out, I've worked it out. There are these screws here along the front that take this little bar off that actually hides your power supply from view. It's quite a cool idea, really. And the thing I like about it is that it's all pretty intuitive. You don't have to like go through the manual time and time again to work out what everything is like you did with the fractal ridge. This seems to be a lot more easier to use. So power supply comes in this little cage down here. It looks as if you screw the back bit at the top there and then all of the cables will come out this side. So let's grab our power supply and today we're using the V750i from Cooler Master. They actually sent me two of these by mistake which was quite funny because I do actually need them and I used them in my previous build and was a little bit disappointed because while this is a 750 watt power supply and you can use it with like an RTX 4080, this does actually have a PCI Gen 5 connector on it but it is only rated for 300 watts. That isn't going to matter with the 4070 Ti because 300 watts plus I think it's 75 from the PCIe slot means you're going to get 375 watts max delivery which is way more than it's going to use but that is super nerdy don't worry about it too much all you need to know is that this power supply is very well suited to this rig mainly because it has 750 watts of power which is more than you're going to need and also because you do have the 12 volt high power PCI Gen 5 connector here that we can use with this GPU everything is modular as well it's gold rated and it shouldn't cost you too much money in the grand scheme of things but if we open up our bundle of cables we can start actually connecting these things now people ask for a close-up so here you go find the label for each one so this is motherboard and then you just plug it in not really too much more to it than that just make sure they're properly pressed so that they click all the way in we're going to use two cpu power connections today no sata or anything because we don't have any sata devices but here is the all important one this very thick 12 volt high power cable it should look a lot cleaner than using the adapters that come in the box, which is nice. But here it is, look, rated for 300 watts. You can see the inside of that cable. Plug it into the power supply, being very sure that this is connected. Then I think this whole thing should now go over this little shield, like so. We use the power supply screws to get this secured to the bracket. Let's grab all of the cables and the power supply, and then we then mount this on the front. So this is gonna get fresh air in almost like a separate loop, which is quite nice. There are a few different areas you can actually mount this because if you're not using a top radiator, you can get yourself more space at the bottom, which of course is great if you're using an extra long graphics card, but you will have to be aware of all of the cables coming out. So you can fit a lot in here, just be a little bit careful with it. Let's get that remounted to the front. Don't forget, by the way, that you will actually need to plug in this little power supply extension into the power supply in order for it to do anything. So do that now, just like that. We have one case fan as standard, so I'm gonna plug this in now while I'm here, it's just at the back of the motherboard. Then we can start thinking about the other cables, and I wanna do all of the front panel connections first. We've got HD audio that goes at the bottom left of the board. We have our USB 3 and Type-C that are next to each other on the far right. I like that ASUS do actually give you this flexible USB-C cable, which is nice, because it gives you a lot more room to manoeuvre. And then of course at the bottom we have our power and then our power LEDs. These are the far bottom right of the board. Ah, now we can focus on the power connections and I have already noticed that we do have a little bit of a length issue. It's not a big issue at all. It's just you can't actually utilize this space here. You're going to have to organize your cables around the sides just because the power supply is obviously in a different position than normal. I'm saying, oh, I don't think it actually matters at all. It's just not quite as neat as normal. It is definitely slightly fiddly, but you can see we've done it just by connecting them at the top left around here. And then when we come around the side to see what I mean about this cable, I would personally like to have a long one that goes all the way down there. But unless you're using extensions, you have to, well, just do that. The ATX, of course, is a lot easier, though. This will plug in just next to this big hole here. And then I think, really, we're actually pretty much done. 
the only thing left to do is actually insert the main event, the RTX 4070 Ti. RTX 4070 Ti. You've got four and a half slots, it seems, down the bottom, so feel free to grab, like, a stupidly big graphics card if you want. This, as I say, be careful the length with some of these connections down there, but you can move it a bit further up. But otherwise, we should be ready just to line this up with our slots. Oh, hang on a minute. What did I just say? Oh, that is tight. I mean, how much further can it actually go up? Is it gonna make any real difference? Let's try that again now, shall we? Will that have made any difference at all? Yes. Uh, yes, yes it will, okay. So you do need to use that top position, look, if you want to fit big graphics cards in. But remember what I said about the cables here? I mean, this fits in without any issue at all, once you've removed the side bit. I would be very cautious about larger cards than this. I mean, something like this Aorus 4090, the largest one I have on hand, I feel like that's gonna run into issues. Do you think it will fit? No, okay, see, that, that won't fit. You're not getting that in there. Asus's own tough card. I'm fairly sure they said this would fit in, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it, personally. PNY 4090, yes, that will go in. That's probably your limit, a PNY 4090. Of course, an actual 4080 fits in there really easily. So yeah, please be careful when you're planning all of this out, because you might run into certain clearance issues that may or may not be remediable, remediable. But we get this screwed into place. We feed the PCI Gen 5 connector through, snatch that at the top, given plenty of force on that to ensure it's secure. I actually believe that is our rig done. I'm honestly really liking this case, really liking this case. Let's uh, actually start putting this back together. So that's the side back on. Now you can see it's looking a lot cleaner. It's just the back side that is going to need a little bit of work, but it's not actually too bad. Just bear in mind that now that we've moved that power supply up, it's not actually gonna be as easy to hide cables at a site because you don't have a great deal of room to do so. I mean, do you see what I mean about thick cables and not having enough clearance? I don't think this is gonna go on actually. I'll try, but I'm not convinced. Oh, okay, just about. A little bit of bulge, but there you go. Actually, even tallestly, that does work. What do you think then? Ah. Oh, Hopefully finished rig. Genuinely very impressed. We've grabbed our monitor. We've grabbed our PC-centric mouse mat that of course you can find links down in the description below if you want to grab one yourself. But there we go, all plugged in. Where is the power button? Let's do this. Well, we've got noise, which is always good, but will we get a display? I mean, I used this motherboard the other day, so I'd like to think so. There we go. CPU or memory changed. We're in luck. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to spin around my chair apparently, but more importantly, to actually get playing some games. And I'll start off by saying that I genuinely love this case. I mean, just look at this. It's so tasteful, it's very clean, very modern, very minimal. And here's the thing, I thought that when you put this side panel on, everything was going to disappear. But actually, if you have a little bit of RGB, you can still see pretty much everything inside it. You get this whole sort of new mesh look. I honestly really love it. But let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. But now, let's focus on the games with some Apex Legends. And here we go, jumping down into the train. Capture the train, or be the last squad alive. I haven't actually played this in a couple of years, but we're gonna give it our best shot. And you can see running at max settings 4K. I mean, I say max settings, which is actually slightly lower, because there is a brand new insane preset. And I've died, but we're looking at around about 120 to 150 FPS at 4K. That's not too shabby. I'll show you, look, for those interested, it's this setting. Look, we could change it from very high to insane, but we get a little warning flash up, so we're gonna leave that alone. We've now turned it down to 1440p, and I mean, just look at that frame rate. Okay, maybe this isn't as good as an RTX 4080, but bear in mind, most people don't need that anyway. I think you're going to really love the performance of this if you're gonna play Apex Legends. Let's press on now to everybody's favorite ray tracing title, some Cyberpunk 2077. And here we're running this at the ray tracing ultra preset. We're going to try a few different resolutions starting at 4K. But you can see that everything is maxed out other than ray trace lighting that we will leave on ultra rather than the max that's psycho. Place your predictions, guys. What do you reckon we're gonna see? I reckon 48 FPS. Actually, it's a lot more. Wow. 
Okay, bearing in mind we just tested the 7900 XTX, that was getting around about 60 to 65. We are quite clearly beating that on what should be a cheaper GPU. So if you want ray tracing, NVIDIA is going to be the way to go. That's actually really impressive. We're pretty much maxing out our GPU utilization as well. I think the processor will probably benefit slightly if you go from the 13th gen, but it doesn't really seem to be causing us a problem whatsoever here, which is really nice to see. And don't forget that if we were using DLSS 3.0, we can't at the moment because it's not actually enabled. For some reason, it hasn't been launched yet by CD Projekt Red. We did have a code earlier that let us unlock it, but it's been a couple of months now, so I'm just waiting for them to actually release the retail. And bearing in mind that this is running at 4K with DLSS set to automatic, I think that is a very, very impressive score. But let's see if we can beat that by turning it down to 1440p. Are we going to get any CPU bottlenecking? And we are actually, yes, we are pretty much on the limit with the i5. So if you are going to play at 1440p, it is going to be worth getting a 13th gen version of the i5 for that little bit extra performance because we're currently getting around about 85 to 90 FPS. But I'd wager we could get a lot closer to 100 if we had a slightly better CPU. But for the sake of 70 quid, it's going to be up to you. There's not going to be too many titles when you're going to run into this problem. But you absolutely have to say this is a jaw-droppingly good-looking game. And if you can actually play this on a cheaper GPU, that is only a good thing. Are you going to notice the difference with a 4080? Well, not if your CPU bottleneck, that's for sure. And this rig is a lot cheaper than the others we've recently built. Our next title you may have heard of. It's very popular. This one is called Fortnite. This is running at DX11 max settings, and we're currently getting around about 120 FPS, although this is actually running at 4K. We are using the brand new temporal resolution technique to actually get an upscaled image, so we're rendering this at slightly lower than 4K, but you wouldn't really know by looking at it, actually. It's a very, very impressive image, and I think that if you are able to run a game like this with this sort of setting, it is impressive. But obviously, when it comes to competitiveness, you're not going to have this turned up to epic like we dab here and everything turned on, all the bells and whistles. You're obviously going to want to have the highest frame rate possible. So if we go into the settings quickly, we can scroll all the way down. So here we are, TSR Epic, Temporal Super Resolution. But we'll turn this down to the high preset, View Distance Max. Post Processing, probably set to medium. And then we'll lower down the resolution as well. And we've got a lovely Fortnite UI issue here, but ignoring that, you can see our frame rate has absolutely skyrocketed to around about 230 FPS or so, which is what? Double, literally double, and the game still looks very good. I would probably turn the dynamic resolution up a little bit so it's slightly sharper, but still, we're able to get around about 180 FPS or so, so it's very, very impressive, and I don't think you're going to have any issues playing a game like Fortnite on a rig like this. I mean, actually, let's change this to native now because I saw a little bit of CPU bottlenecking. So immediately the image has improved and does look better. And you can see we're not really running into much stutter or anything like we were before where we were actually a little bit CPU bottlenecked. That is much, much better. And we're still getting a sky high frame rate of around about 150, 160 FPS or so. So if you do want to run this at 1440p, 240Hz, you have to tweak the settings down a little bit more. But in that scenario, I would recommend going for the 13th gen i5 as you are going to get slightly better performance. I should also point out, by the way, that in terms of thermals and acoustics, this is the quietest PC I've built in such a long time. Bear in mind, I haven't really tweaked anything, just the fan curve. We're currently getting around about 61 degrees on the CPU, 59 on the GPU, and just listen to this. Like, this PC is running flat out at the moment when it comes to GPU, and it's using quite a lot of the processor as well, and it is literally silent for all intents and purposes. If you had any other noise in the room whatsoever, you, you wouldn't even be able to hear anything whirring away. Very, very impressive. But here is, no doubt, the game you've been waiting for, some Call of Duty Warzone 2.0. This is currently running at 4K. This is using DLSS, but this is set to the Ultra preset, where the texture is turned up to the maximum. And you can see we're actually getting a very, very respectable frame rate of around about 130 or so. Which, bear in mind, this is not the most expensive PC in the world. I mean, it's not going to be a cheap one, but everything else, as we said, is sort of built around a budget. Uh, I think it's very, very impressive because I don't think anyone's going to be playing this game at 4K anyway. You'd much rather turn it down. But it's nice to know that you can do it if you ever needed to do it or you're running on like a high resolution monitor or something. It is pretty cool. But if we quickly turn it down to 1440p so you can see the difference, you will see that the frame rate has shot up by a fair margin, around about 150, 160 FPS now. This is actually another title where I think 
We're starting to see a little bit of CPU bottlenecking. It is subtle. We're around about 92 to 96% GPU utilization. So while I think it's a solid option to go for the cheaper CPU, ultimately, I think my advice would be to grab a motherboard that you can BIOS update without the need for an existing CPU, so BIOS flashback, and then grab the 13th gen if you can afford the difference, because I think it's gonna give you that little bit extra headroom that in something like Warzone, you will definitely appreciate. It's not that it's bad, it's definitely not. It's still close to 150 FPS. It's just that you're leaving ever so slight amounts of performance on the table. So there you go then, our RTX 4070 Ti gaming PC. And genuinely, I think this has been an absolute blast. I simply adore this chassis. I am strongly considering using this for my own personal rig downstairs on the TV, where I pretty much do all of my gaming these days. Because I love how compact it is, yet it can actually fit everything in. I would just be very cautious of oversized graphics cards. Check the website for the maximum length because you don't want to go over this because you run into problems. And as I've mentioned, I would recommend going for a slightly higher spec CPU if you're gonna be running this at high refresh rates flat out because I think you're leaving a smidgen of extra performance on the table. But it is nice to know that you can just upgrade this whenever you want as long as you're willing to do the BIOS update. So let me know your thoughts on this down in the comment section below. What do you make of the 4070 Ti? What do you make of its performance, the looks, the whole system? Absolutely smash the like button if you've enjoyed this video, get yourself subscribed, buy yourself a mouse mat before the time is gone. Wait a minute, the time is gone. Second wave, you can get on the second wave, find the full link for this down below and you can land yourself a beautiful mouse mat. But thank you so much for watching. If you do want to check out current pricing on anything that's actually featured in this rig, then as always, you can find that link down below with my Amazon affiliate links. And while you're down there, be sure to check out AlphaSync. AlphaSync brings you a worry-free PC gaming experience with a huge range of custom-built gaming PCs. With a 4.8 rating on Trustpilot and free next day delivery available on selected builds, why not let AlphaSync take all of the stress out of PC gaming? Get started today with the link down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.